Yeah, I'll, I'll try not to get too long-winded because um, actually, Corey, Corey covered a, a, a talked about some of the ag stuff in his presentation also. But um, like Michael said, I'm Ted Rainwater. Uh, I'm biologist with Quail Forever down in the Low Country, um, down around uh, Hampton, Allendale area. Um, but I kind of travel around a little bit all over the state. Um, uh, primarily working a lot with ag, ag lands, um, uh, trying to promote farm bill um, um, programs, different cost share programs that are out there available for you guys. Um, and I think uh, Andy's going to speak on that a little more in a little while, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail with that. But um, uh, again, uh, uh, like I said, I work for Quail Forever. However, I kind of work for, uh, yes, I'm in a partnership position with, with DNR Quail Forever and um, the, the NRCS. Um, we're, we, uh, shortly, towards the end of the month, we will have another biologist with Quail Forever up here on the Indian Creek um, project. So there'll be two of us in the state. Uh, but again, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're in partnership positions. We're just like uh, everybody else. We work very closely with DNR and NRCS and Forest Service and all the other partners out there. Um, anyway, uh, today, like I said, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about ag, ag lands. Um, I know if you, if you guys are like me, I grew up quail hunting in the 80s. Um, quite a bit of quail. I was down, I'm, I'm from down around the PD area. This is what we hunted, was ag fields. Um, I think it's a extremely, um, uh, valuable uh, landscape type there for, for quail that are out there. Um, I grew up hunting the small farms, hunting hedgerows in ag fields. You know, good. Uh, our fields were weedy back then. You know, we already talked about that earlier. That uh, this modern farming and, and, and clean farming has really really changed our, our whole landscape out there. Um, so j just just into that. Um, there, I'm, I'm going to go into a few things that we can do as, as, as landowners and, and small farmers to, that can just do little things that might help, help quail populations. One of them is no-till. Um, no-tilling, strip-tilling. Um, I, really, I really like it. Um, as you can see, uh, there's still some cover left out there on the ground. I, you know, a lot of times if it's out there right when it's planted, and you're just conventional tilling, it's, it's just bare dirt. There's really no reason, you know, if, if a bird is out there in that field, he's, he's a sitting duck. I mean, he's, he's out there ready to get picked off um, and eaten by, by some kind of predator. Whereas no-till, at least there's still a little bit of cover out there. Um, another one I really like and, and we promote through our farm bill programs also is, um, is um, cover crops, planting in the cover crops. A lot of farmers are using uh, cereal rye. Um, if you're familiar with cereal rye, it gets up real tall, good wildlife food, um, especially in the spring and summer. Um, I was just talking to a landowner the other day that does a lot, of, a lot of cover crops and they've got a lot of quail on their property and he was talking about all the quail that they, they see in the spring and summer in those cover crop fields of rye. He said they see a lot in there. Um, and what they're doing with that cover crops, they're just going right in there and no-till planting. Um, uh, I think they're planting a lot of peanuts on theirs, but they're, they're going right in and planting the inside that cover crop. So they're still, you know, they're not mowing it down or anything. That, that cover crop's still there mm -hmm. on the ground, providing seed, attracting a lot of insects already. Um, so I really, I really do like no-tilling and, and planting into cover crops. I think it's a, it's a good thing. It, it, it's, it's just one more thing. It's just kind of protecting our birds out there. This was a study done back, um, a few years back from, with, with NC State, and they were kind of looking at that and, and looking at how long it took a bird to, I guess, go out there and pretty much get full um, on, on different seeds and stuff. And they were studying conventional plantings as opposed to no-till. Um, and as you can see, what, what's critical here is the hours that they spent out here in these fields. They had to spend a lot more time out there feeding in those conventional planted fields as opposed to the no-till. Um, and the more hours they're out there, that's the more hours they're exposed to predators. We want, we, we want to see this. We want to see less hours out there feeding. Um, so that's where 
Uh, this study was, was pre pretty neat study there showing, um, and it just shows the benefits there again of, of no-till farming. Um, and there's all kinds of other benefits, you know, soil erosion, um, nutrient, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's, there's, there's just really a lot of good benefits to it. So um, if you have the capability to do it, I, I highly recommend it. Um, even some of your local um, NRCS offices and stuff, soil and water conservation districts have no-till drills that you, you know, that are there available for loan at your at the local offices. Um, some of them do have that, so that's, that's another option for you guys. Um, modern farming, you, we see it all the time, planting tree line to tree line. A lot of times farmers now, they're running ditch bank cutters even along the sides of the fields, keeping everything cut back real clean on the sides, keeping the ditch banks cut back, um, just not what it used to be. Um, now, even back in the 80s when I was growing up bird hunting, it's just, just a whole lot different. Um, so, and Michael mentioned it earlier, um, you know, what we're trying to do is, is get these, let me go back to that slide. One of the things that, that if you just ride around today um, on your way home, just look around at some of these crop fields, you'll see it. The, they're not producing on the sides of these fields like they are. The yields are just not there. Um, a lot of farmers are losing money. Um, and there's been some, some great studies that have been going on about this with precision ag and everything. There's a lot of farmers losing money out there planting unproductive areas and fields. Um, and that's where the precision ag thing, and I'm just, I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that it, it's really going to take off. It's starting to in the southeast. Quail Forever actually has, has hired a precision ag specialist that's working um, partially funded by the cotton board. Um, he's working in the southeast. He's primarily in Georgia, but I'm actually going to be working with him here in South Carolina on a project, uh, hopefully coming up. Um, and where they're doing is, is using this precision ag stuff, looking at, you know, yield over fields over time, looking at the soils, and what they're finding is, hey, you know, you, some of these farmers are actually losing money in these unproductive areas. And so by going in and taking out these unproductive areas and putting field borders in or some conservation cover, putting it in one of these farm bill programs, um, farmers are actually making more money on the field by doing that, taking those unproductive areas out, putting them in, in programs, and then um, you know, continuing to farm the other parts, of the, good, the good productive parts of the field. So it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Um, and what, what they were telling, telling me a while back is, this stuff's going on big time in the Midwest, and, and the farmers are bought in in the Midwest. Um, it's just trying to get everybody to, to start using it here. Um, so it's, uh, it's gonna be interesting. I think it's some really, really good stuff there. Um, and, and again, you know, one of the biggest things that, that I try to promote, and we, we promote through the, the different farm bill programs uh, with, when it comes to ag fields, is field borders. Um, you know, really any little bit helps if you can leave off a border along the edges of these fields. You know, minimum we normally say 25 to 50 feet. Um, if you go out to 150, it's, you know, that's, that's even better. Um, good luck trying to get a farmer to want to get that far, but hey, every little bit helps. Another thing is if you can leave, you know, on the edges of these field borders, get them to leave, or, or if you're farming the field, leave a little bit of standing crop along the edge too to leave some food there. But these field borders, you know, they, they, they're creating excellent travel corridors, connectivity between fields, um, normally producing good uh, nesting and brood rearing cover um, throughout these fields. Um, and a lot of times it can be just done, you know, I, I, I try to recommend, Michael touched on it earlier, just, you know, you don't have to go in there and, and, and go gung-ho right at first trying to plant a bunch of native warm season grasses and legumes and forbs. Sometimes it's just letting that, you know, setting off that field border and just letting it sit for a year or two to see if it'll, if, you, if you've got time to do it, just do that. And, and a lot of times this, this, a lot of this stuff will just come up native. Um, it's already in the seed bank. Um, so, so field borders are just really, really, um, really, really great, great thing in ag settings, and I, I really do recommend it if you, if you can. And a lot of times you're not, 
you're not losing much by, by taking those borders out. They're already unproductive. Um, one of the farm bill programs is CP33. Um, it was a border, um, field border program, um, CRP program. Um, it's, it's a really good program. Um, you can also do field borders through the EQIP program. Uh, so that's, that's another one. Um, it's just another picture there. And that's just kind of, you know, I talk about taking out unproductive uh, parts. This is just kind of a, a odd shaped corner of a field. You know, sometimes farmers you take that odd shaped corner off and square it off and just let that odd, odd shaped corner go fallow. Um, that's, a, that's another good idea. The farmer might like you for doing that, is not having to maneuver equipment around so much. Um, but that, that's a really good, good example there. You can kind of see the little cove going there. Um, so that's, a, that's another idea, just taking some, you know, squaring up fields um, and letting those go fallow. One thing I will mention about doing this and, and field borders and everything, um, I see this a lot going and visiting properties that, that have them. Um, it's, I can't stress to you importance enough of uh, maintaining these borders. Don't just let them go and walk away from them. You can't do that. You gotta, and normally in these, these CRP contracts and stuff, there are maintenance sec por portions of those contracts where you either go in and winter disc them, uh, you know, winter disc a third of them a year, or prescribe burn them. Uh, key thing there is just disturbance. Gotta, gotta continue to to maintain them and, and create some a little bit of disturbance in them every year, um, and normally during those winter months. Um, so that's that's another key point to field borders. Um, a lot of I was just on a property this weekend uh, that they're looking at doing doing some field borders and stuff, and it, it worked out good. They got pivots all over the property, um, and those pivots, if you're familiar with them, a lot of times they don't they don't cover the entire field. They'll have a a corner uh, where that end gun can't reach and these particular fields I looked at this weekend were I mean it was perfect you could see the distinct line of soybeans and you know the where the pivot was hitting the soybeans were this high and then it just dropped down right where that end gun wasn't hitting they were they were probably a foot high um, and that was it, it worked out great it was a good visual for the landowner and they were agreeing they said we're, we're going to take that out of production um, and, and just put it in one of these programs and, and let that go fallow um, so pivot ends uh, are another good example. Again, ditch banks, um, you know, it, it's modern farming. Everybody's mowing them with sidearm mowers and everything. We like to let them grow up. Um, it again, creates more travel corridors. Um, you know, if you are gonna mow them, you know, if they start getting too out of hand, because sometimes you do have to manage them. Um, if you could get a fire to run through them, that's great. Another thing you can do is, is mow one side of the ditch one year, and then another side the other, just to, to, to always have some kind of cover in there for them. Um, but, um, and then breaking up fields, another thing, uh, some, I know going back, there was a lot of people broke up fields with, with um, longleaf, I mean not longleaf, loblolly pines. Um, we, we try to recommend if you are gonna use pines and, you, and your soils are suitable for longleaf, um, use longleaf to break those fields up. It's another good, good option because it allows that sunlight to, to get in there um, a lot, lot better than the loblolly does. But, um, but overall, if I were to break up fields, we, we try to say use these, these um, just weedy, shrubby hedgerows instead. Um, uh, just kind of let them, again, letting them go fallow, kind of leaving some, some fallow strips out across the middle of the fields. Another thing you can do is filter strips also. Um, it's just a picture there of leaving some extra crops. And this is another thing, you know, a lot of times you see this wet, wet corners of fields. That's another area um, where farmers can't get in there to, a lot of times to get their crops out. Sometimes it pays just to let those areas go fallow. So um, that's again, that, that precision ag stuff and looking at soils, maps of fields and everything, it's, it is, it really tells it. Um, it's filter strip in a field, um, another great way, leaving a, a, a grassy filter strip um, that, that also creates good habitat, letting that grow up. Um, you can see a lot of, lot of bunch grasses coming up in this filter strip here also. So 
Um, also provides more connectivity across fields for, for birds to be able to, to travel. Um, I, talk, I touched on this already kind of is, is maintaining these borders. Um, usually, I, you know, I probably the best tool is, is, is like Michael mentioned earlier in the fields <laughs> earlier is disking. Don't bush hog, um, you know, winter disk. Disk between November and February. Um, strip disking, winter disking. If you are going to strip disk, make those, those strips fairly wide. You don't want real narrow strips. Um, but, um, and then another thing is if you've got a field that's just unproductive and can afford to, let it go fallow. Uh, quail, don't, quail don't need trees. They're grassland shrub species. Um, so um, if you can get by with letting it go, go fallow in the whole field, um, that, that's great too, uh, but again, got to manage it with some, some winter disc and a lot of times it's, it's probably the best tool. Um, I am not, this is, this is going to be Breck stuff on the NBCI, but that was real quick, just kind of a little bit about some ag, ag management and fields. Um, you guys got any questions? I think Dan's coming up next. <laughs> 